there is a new sound in the winds that sing on the Serengeti. A strange bird soars the ridges of the Rift Valley. An unfamiliar shadow on the plains below stirs primitive memories from the time of the pterodactyl. But this bird has come to fly where no eagle would dare. From the snow-capped summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. To Ernest Hemingway, it was as high and as wide as all the world. To the Africans, it is a spiritual place, the throne of God. But if God had meant man to fly to such places, he would have given him wings. Perhaps, in a way, he has. Since the beginning, man has dreamt of flying like a bird. A long way from Africa, in the modern world of Sydney, Australia, two men, father and son, share the vision of Icarus. Their challenge is to fly from the summit of Kilimanjaro. And like the Greek legend, their ambition will take them higher than the clouds and dangerously close to the sun. Stanwell Park, Sydney. An international hang gliding competition is in progress. All eyes are on Steve Moyes because he's one of the best in the world. They've long since forgotten the achievements of his father, Bill. Bill Moyes was one of the first men to make an ancient dream come true. The first to put on wings and soar like an eagle. Bill is the modern Daedalus, the father of the sport of hang gliding. His son, Stephen, like Icarus, has grown up with wings. To him, flying is as natural as walking. He has inherited the sky. At the time we first met, Bill was already past his prime as a hang glider pilot. Today, he hardly flies at all, but lives out his involvement by designing the gliders that Steve pilots in international competition. Bill and Steve have had great success. Steve has won four world championships and the US Masters of hang gliding three times in succession. But he is 27 now and wants to be in charge of his own career. Bill is ready to hand over his wings to his son and heir, but not before a last flight together. A final rite of passage. Seventeen years ago, Kite Man Bill was thrilling the crowds at fairgrounds all over the world. It was the first time anyone had ever seen a man with wings. Wherever he went, he created new records. The first to fly the Grand Canyon. The first to drop from a balloon 12,000 feet in the air. 
the only man ever to tow behind an aeroplane to more than 14,000 feet. All that in a flimsy collapsible kite that could easily be flipped into a terminal dive. But Kilimanjaro is the one record that has eluded him. The descent from the summit to the plains, 16,000 feet below, is an even greater descent than Mount Everest, which rises out of a plateau. For a hang glider pilot, Kilimanjaro is the supreme challenge. Bill leads an elemental life, close to the air and water. He's up with the birds every morning and goes running on the beach opposite his home. But Steve is only an occasional surfer. A lot of people told me that life begins at 40. And I thought it would be the uh, beginning of the end. And then I reached the age of 40. And they said, see, it's not so bad. But they were wrong. I was right. Reaching 40 is the beginning of the end. I found that I was not as active. And 50 holds the same fears. Bill is always trying something new, not always successfully. This was the world's first attempt at skiing on bare hands. He failed, and no one else has since attempted it. The first flights were made in an unstable device that resembled the traditional kite. But it was the design of Francis Regello, a NASA scientist, who was searching for a replacement for spacecraft re-entry parachutes that inspired the first delta-winged hang glider. Today, Bill is looking back to nature for inspiration. The pelican has wings capable of lifting heavy loads. That should make a fairly big kite, but it'll weigh about 70 pounds. We'll have to try and uh, trim down the weight in the tubes. Like the pelican, the Kilimanjaro kites will have to lift heavy loads in thin air. But they can't be so big as to be uncontrollable in the strong winds on the mountain. For the first time, Bill is putting Steve in charge of the design. I'll accept his advice if he can design a glider that will take off easily in thin atmosphere, then he will have passed that test. The hang glider is given a destruction test. It survives to 60 miles per hour. But is it strong enough for Kilimanjaro? Only the flight will tell. Meanwhile, at the Cumberland College of Health Sciences at Sydney, Bill and Steve are tested to the limit. They will make heavy demands on their bodies at 20,000 feet, the level when humans become dependent on additional oxygen. A calculation is made to see how efficiently their bodies use oxygen. High altitude plays strange tricks on the brain. Hypoxia, or oxygen starvation, can affect any climber, regardless of how fit he is. At 20,000 feet in a decompression chamber, they experience the symptoms. Steve has trouble remembering his own telephone number. Bill is confused by a child's puzzle. They learn how easy it is to make a mistake at altitude. At a clifftop near Sydney, a Kilimanjaro prototype glider is given its first test flight. In the dense air at sea level, the glider has a stall speed of 15 knots, so it takes off easily into the 20 knot breeze. But in the thin air of Kilimanjaro, they will have to run and run fast. We'll go over to the surf club, try and get it down. Steve takes the glider on a flight of several miles. And 
over the surf club. And uses the two-way radio for the first time. Then turn into the wind. Just bleed off the speed. Just bleed off the speed. Just bleed off the speed. And land. At last, it's time for us to leave. Ahead lies a flight of over 10,000 miles to Africa via India. Our last glimpse of Sydney is the sand hills where Steve first learned how to foot launch a glider and where for many years Bill conducted his hang gliding school for beginners. This is the crown of Africa, regally standing above cloud three miles high. The massive crater, one and a half miles in diameter, rises from a base covering two and a half thousand square miles. The top is permanent ice, and it's only a few hundred miles from the equator. The center of volcanic activity, Kibo, still has hot steam emitting from the fumaroles. From Kilimanjaro International Airport, only 30 miles from the mountain, we begin our hang gliding safari. We're driving towards the escarpment of the Great Rift Valley. This is Maasai land. There's a feeling of timelessness and infinite space. We see our first Maasai. Children grazing their cattle near the road wave us down and ask for trinkets. Even in children, their dignity is remarkable. Independent to the point of arrogance. They take gifts without thanks, as if they own them anyway. And the tourists are just paying their toll on the way through. But there is one use for Western culture. Old car tires are made into shoes. And Ngorongoro Lodge is the place to acclimatize to a higher altitude. It's 7,000 feet, a good transition between sea level and the mountain. Bill and Steve need time to get used to taking off in thin air. The 2,000 foot crater wall is an ideal flying site. On three, you ready? One, two, three. It's the first flight, and the takeoff is a near disaster. The lift is much less than Steve thought. The glider sinks like a stone, clipping a bush on the way. Steve is a grasp of the, uh, on the control bar here. That was a hairy launch, man. The camera on the kite shows Steve's view of the point of no return. Nice lift here. Steve has found a thermal. Just light. There's a five up. Five up. It means he's climbing at 500 feet a minute. Now his hands are full, flying between the rising masses of hot air and the colder falling air. In hang gliding language, it's called going over the falls, and it gives a pilot a rough ride. It's really bumpy. I'll have to. I'm still puffing from the launch. Let me fill up your cut. Uh, there's bulk lift here. I just got to handle the bumps. It's pretty turbulent. In the middle of all the turbulence, Steve is trying to operate the cameras and finding some problems. The glider's reacting really, really differently with the, with the camera on. Suddenly, he disappears under a hillside. Radio contact is lost. Bill is anxious. A wildlife park is no place for crash landings. There are dangerous animals everywhere, and any sighting is treated seriously. Alan. Alan? I'm looking up the track about a thousand yards past uh, where you've got your truck parked, and it looks like there's a pride of lions up there. Will you keep your eye on that direction? 
In the crater, the armed guards are on the alert. At last, he reappears. Lower, but still looking for lift. While he's still flying, Steve is safe. In the crater, the safest place for any bird is in the air. Like the marabou stork, Steve relies on the thermals to keep him up. There's one coming to have a look at me right now. Thermals are the results of the earth heating, causing the air around it to break off and rise in a huge bubble. They keep rising till they cool down and become clouds. The glider has instruments to detect thermals, but another sure way is to follow a bird. Steve, those lions I reported earlier, they've got horns, so it's OK. OK. Now there's something else that Steve has to practice. The two-way radio system that's easy to use on the ground is clumsy on a glider. Just come around this tree. Don't forget your camera. I see a shadow of bird above me. Turn your camera on. I'm on the final now. Camera on. Keep up plenty of speed. Keep up plenty of speed. Drop out of prone. Push out. A better takeoff site is required, and Steve wants to survey the area for a cross country flight. The altimeter gives a picture of the terrain, a measure of the height of the hills. You see many flamingos on the lake? That's what these pink things Yes, are. all over the lake, thousands, maybe millions of them. Yeah, it would be great to fly around here. This is a perfect slope for, uh, for flying from. The top? Yeah, all around the edge here. And what are these two men? Oh, these are Maasai warriors. Oh, they're the Maasai. Yeah. They can fight lions or men. Sometimes they fight lion because the lion have attacked their cows. They are very strong, very strong people. Hey, Bill. While Steve's been on his survey, Bill has been doing what he enjoys most, tinkering with gliders and gathering local knowledge from the birds, because tomorrow he's going to join them. Birds going up on cold air convecting down the side of the hill, and look at them all going up in the middle. They've had a good day. They've been flying all day, and they still, they still got to get a last flap in before they go home. We found a per. Well, they probably are going home. We found a perfect going. launch that faces east, southeast, 120 degrees. It's perfect. This hey, gorge. Look where they've gone. They've gone right over the top of it. At nine the next morning, the crater is still cool from the morning mist. The Maasai are curious. For the first time, these warriors will see a man fly like a bird. Within an hour, the sun heats the earth to trigger temperature the point at which the thermals begin to break away. The dust devil is a sure sign that the air is rising. This is a special moment for Bill. Okay, we'll take your... It's not only his first flight in Africa, it's his first ever thermal flight in a modern glider. Go on, Bill. I'm going to fly in your wake, like you said. There it goes. Not 
I think we're going downwind, Bill. We better start heading back. Okay. In Bill's day, the kites were not rigid enough to withstand the heavy turbulence. Turn right now, Bill. Even with a modern glider, a parachute is still a necessity in case they're tossed upside down. I got a couple of bubbles. I think I'm about to launch height. Yeah, you're a lot higher than me. I'm just behind you, about 200 feet lower. Oh, that's strong lift. It's uh, pretty gusty, isn't it? I'm just getting bounced up and down. Mate, let's make one more pass left, back into that bubble that we just had. OK, so keep going this way. Coming over to your bill, looks like a good one. How strong is it? Go up about 300 feet and hang on hard, it's puppy. Turn now, man, it's five up here. I got four. Oh, this is too much. We're gonna go up the base here so far. I've only got a t-shirt on, I'm gonna pull out before that. Those three eagles are climbing right out in front of me now. I'm going to head out straight for them. In the valley below, the guards are looking for a landing site clear of animals. After a half-hour flight, Bill and Steve head for the landing on the edge of the lake, well away from the lions, but close to the thousands of flamingos. I can see the uh, flamingos moving away from you now. They look like uh, some sort of custard moving. On the water here, it gives you no depth perception. Do I look low yet? I feel like I'm really high still, though. Yeah? They are pink. I didn't realise they were that pink from uh, down the ground. It looks incredible on the water here. You wonder how there could be so many of them. You ought to see all the wings in the air now. They're all just flapping. They're not really frightened, but they're all getting excited. Uh-oh, we're going to get them by surprise here, man. The gliders are indeed strange birds in paradise. Ah, oh, that was brilliant. It's the first time for years that Bill and Steve have flown together. How come you left me? I thought yeah. I was doing all right. You respect out so far away. And Steve is doing his best yeah. to be uh, diplomatic. Well, you were in the same time, weren't you? Yeah, well, there was... Uh, just a, a little bit stronger bit. Yeah? Yeah, next time I looked around, you were thousands of feet above me. <laughs> the 2,000 foot climb out of the crater, which takes five minutes in a thermal, is a tedious hour in a four wheel drive. Yeah. By the time they reassemble the gliders, <laughs> curiosity has got the best of the Maasai. When you go up there, how is it? How does it look like? Uh, it looks like 
you can see all the way to Lake yeah. Isa mm. and Lake Minyara and Serengeti. Yeah, easy. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> They make three flights that day. Each time, Bill increases in confidence and Steve improves his camera work. like a bat somehow it was very frightened that's why you're not afraid of anything yeah we are not afraid of, of wild animals but we are afraid of such a thing which is going on there yeah. does it has an engine no, 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 no nothing of that sort what is it using the wind wind does it has a propeller no no mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. interesting thing Bill's hunt for thermals takes him across the crater and well away from the landing site. Has he forgotten where he is? The guards are concerned and follow him. Steve, are you down yet? Yeah, I've uh, landed. I'm all packed up. I'm on the car uh, just looking for her. Where are you? I fell a long way short. I'm way down near the corner of the lake in the southern corner, and I'm walking back towards the road so you'll be able to pick me up easily. I can't see any animals just yet except a, a bunch of gazelle. There's a lot of animals down here. You never can tell what's around. As I spoke too soon, there's a bunch of... Looks like a lion in a thicket just ahead. I think you better rush it and come and get me, will you? All right, we're on our way. We'll be uh, there as soon as we can. Okay. This lion's looking hard at me now, Steve. I wish you'd hurry up. I'm glad to see you, and that guy with the gun. Wrapping a kite is normally a 25-minute operation. But with incentive, it can be done faster. In every culture, people dream of flying. The word about the crater flights quickly passes among the Maasai. The warriors persuade Steve to fly down to Aboma, a native village outside the crater, so they can show their women and children the Birdman. It's a unique encounter. Birdman meets the son of the desert. Will he take off again? Is it safe to touch it? Is it possible to have a fly in it? Masai pilot is not happy. We need more wind. More wind. He wonders why the glider didn't soar over the village. The wind is, uh, this is bad because he doesn't want to take off. Why? Then he starts to look around. Then he said, where can I land then? Where? Where? 
The aristocratic Maasai is one of the few tribes that has managed to resist Western culture. No one is willing to argue with these fierce warriors who migrated from the Nile region more than four centuries ago. But the government is anxious to change their nomadic ways. The Maasai believe that all the land belongs to God, but all the cattle belong to the Maasai. Their lives revolve around their cattle. They drink the milk and the blood of the beast, and their houses are built of dung. When they want more cattle to buy wives, they raid another tribe and take back what is theirs. These ways are at odds with modern Africa, but it suits the Maasai. The Maasai are impressed by the courage of the birdmen. Now it is their turn to show their prowess in lion hunting. This is how the Maasai sons prove themselves to their fathers. Traditionally, to become warriors, they must kill a lion. That lion is very, very dangerous. The last one, because you saw the lion's babies, he was just taking care of them to stop enemy to attack them. So he must be very angry and very, very dangerous. It's not very easy to kill a lion. It is a very big war. It is about 20 spears to kill the lion. It is necessary for the lion to be in the center of them so they can throw their spears to the lion. Over generations, the lions have been conditioned to fear them. But today, the government has forbidden the Maasai to continue this ritual. It's now only a matter of time before the lion forgets their fear of the Maasai, and the Maasai and their herds will no longer be safe from attack. Tonight, there's a sing-song in the bomber. It's a rare honor to be invited. <laughs> The song is about a successful cattle raid. It honors the returning warriors and is performed to evoke envy in those who did not go. But it's all part of a dying tradition. Cattle raiding has also been banned by the government. at Lake Manyara to hear the sound of death in the morning. A buffalo falls prey to the hungry lions and the vultures swarm in like uninvited guests at the royal feast. The last lioness makes a valiant attempt to rescue the meal, but the odds are against her. She retreats in disgust. It's a time-honored pecking order. When the lion is finished, in comes the hyena, the vulture, and the marabou stork, but only when the lion is finished. If Ngorongoro Crater is the Garden of Eden, then Lake Manyara is its aviary. Its remarkably high biomass is nourished by the water that seeps down from the rift wall. Wow. Look at this amazing mess of earth. 
Well, look at that marabou stalk there. He looks just like my old headmaster. He used to strut about like that with his hands behind his back and... The lake supports more than 380 species of birds, an endless source of inspiration for Bill, and a flying lesson, too. The pelicans, their bellies full of fish, lumber into the air as the first thermals begin to rise. It's nature's flying circus. Within minutes, the sky has become a giant carousel. The way these vultures fly is very much the way that we're forced to fly. We're flying with heavily loaded wings, just as they are. I think there's a bit to be learned from them. They keep their span really efficient most of the time and use their tails to turn. Look at that one, he's got one tip curved up and the other tip curved down. That's like skirting the edge of a the thermal. A storm over the Rift Valley is stirring up the air. There's just enough time left for Steve to join the parade. It's possible to think like a bird when you fly with the eagles because they're not scared of you and they come up close to you and you can tell what that bird's thinking. There's an elephant just uh, down by, behind that tree from where you are, and uh, big tusker. I wonder what he's going to think of the glider, I don't Steve's landing site is occupied by an elephant, one of the most aggressive and unpredictable animals in Africa. But the shadow of the glider triggers in him some primordial fear. I can only get the shadow in one more time and then come in on final. Here it comes, 30. 20, 10, there he is, over. Okay, coming in on final. After 10 days of preparations, it's the end of the hang gliding safari. Now it's time for the challenge of the mountain. We begin the climb, fresh and full of determination. The expedition is made up of Bill and Steve, six film crew, three guides, and 40 porters to carry the food and equipment. Bill strides on ahead, but Steve lingers behind, contemplating the possibility of a crash landing in the trees. I'm taking flares, a whistle, a mirror, matches, a rope to climb down out of the trees, water, a knife to keep the animals away, <laughs> and a compass and map. The rainforest has all the enchantment of a fairy tale. Wandering through here, it's easy to forget about the giant that lies ahead. In five hours, we climb over 4,000 feet. The 
the 50 mile ascent of Kilimanjaro will be like a journey from the equator to the North Pole. There are three distinct zones, rainforest, heather, and alpine desert, crowned with a permanent ice cap. The ascent is in four stages of 3,000 feet each, spending nights at Mandara, Horombo, and Kibo huts. Above this, there is the final ascent to the summit at 19,000 feet. After a night at Mandara hut at 10,000 feet, they're out of the forest and into the heather. In front, Bill is setting a challenging pace. I think that you have to govern your body's output to match your age. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of being able to grind the younger guys into the ground. Mm. The younger the guy is, the more you want to beat him. Yeah, Bill loves to win. For him to arrive first at the first hut is like a victory, and he's taught me the same way, to love winning. If you didn't compete, you would not have earned the right to survive. Higher up the mountain, the guide forces us to slow down. It is essential to give the body time to acclimatize. Age and athletic ability are not as important as pacing and gradual adjustment to the lower oxygen levels. And sometimes it doesn't pay to be first, as Bill discovers after leading the way through the ticks. Every hour, we stop to rest and sit there gasping for breath while the porters, with a touch of contempt, drag on their cigarettes. Even with a full load of 30 pounds, they could beat us to Kibo by a day. In a giant's garden, there are giant plants, like the magnificent lobelia that grows only at this altitude. Closer to Horombo, the giant groundsel, six or seven feet tall, loom out of the mist like sentries guarding the mountain. By late afternoon, we arrive at Horombo Hut, 12,500 feet above sea level, and halfway to the top. The air is noticeably thinner. The temperature is falling quickly to freezing. No matter how far you go, there's still more of that bloody mountain to go. Doesn't seem to be any end to it. Five and a half hours. At home in Sydney, Bill swims every day of the year. Up here, a little ice in the waterfall is not enough to put him off his routine. There's a warning in the guidebook not to bathe in the creek, but that only encourages Bill more. The guides, Remy, Stephen and Christopher, prepare the evening meal. We eat fatty foods at night to provide energy the following afternoon. Breakfast is high in carbohydrates and sugar to generate more immediate energy. At this altitude, the basics of life assume great importance. Meals become the high point of the day. Drinking water is vital. Our bodies need five pints of fluid a day just to replace what is lost through dehydration. Fuel is at a premium and the huts are freezing at night. But after a day's climb, it's not hard to get to sleep. We spend two nights at Horombo, acclimatizing, preparing our bodies for the task ahead and watching the pattern of the clouds that blanket the mountain every day. Come on, what do you got in there, man? Here, shut up. Hang on to that. Get that arm out of there. Oh, that's too heavy. You'll wear yourself out carrying that thing. Mate, I'm twice as tough as you are. Oh, you're measuring everything yeah. by your own standard. You used to be. <laughs> Let's see. That weighs about 20 pounds. Okay. 
Is that yours, huh? By the time you get to the top, you'll be all worn out. You should be conserving energy at this stage. Not me, mate. Steve and I live differently. I am a worker, and I just grind on through jobs. Whereas Steve has more natural ability and sort of flows with his tasks. If he's got a, a difficult task, he seems to find an easy way to do it. Have you learned anything from him? Yeah, I've learned that I'm going to do it my way and he's going to do it his. Because he's the boss at home, he depends on people to do things for him all the time and I just refuse to do anything for him. Because the mountain's an independent thing. If someone relies on the other people to keep him going, they drag so much out of the other people that it destroys the whole expedition. So I try to keep my own strength for the last climb. I'm glad I breathe and an easy eyes can sing. <laughs> Let's have a break. So we went on that trip. <laughs> Check your pulse and I'll check mine. Twenty-four for ten seconds. A hundred and forty-four a minute is too fast. One. Bill is less than a hundred a minute and doing well. Well, there you are. I'm not so bad for an old guy, am I? <laughs> You're laughing at me. We are in the saddle that stretches between Kibo and Mowenzi. Mowenzi, 2,000 feet lower than Kibo, is all that's left of a much older crater. At 16,000 feet, we are in the Alpine desert. The transition is sudden, and it seems to change our state of mind. The land is barren, the air is thin, and the pace is slower. But the challenge is getting very close. Might be a while since I've uh, done anything like this. I haven't forgotten. I can still remember that. Every, every launch you've done, but you've taken your feet off the ground too early and you haven't pushed with your legs. Yeah, that's because it's been so easy. And it's mm. just floated off. Yeah, but if you think this one's going to be easy, man, well... Take a stretcher up there ready for you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I don't need anyone to nurse me. Uh, you might laugh, but I am indestructible. I've been in lots of tight situations. Uh, I should have died a dozen times, and I didn't. I don't know whether someone's looking after me or whether I've been lucky, but I've fallen uh, 300 feet five times. I've been uh, in boats that sunk 10 miles at sea, I've always managed to get back. I've always managed to survive these things. So, uh, a little flight like this shouldn't give me too much trouble. The main worries are I'm dealing with an old man that thinks he knows everything. He's probably going to trip over on launch and break his arm. You can tell when people are going to hurt themselves. He's going to go. There's no doubt about it. And it's just my job to make sure that he makes it. By the time we reach the hut, breathing is becoming a conscious effort. The only sign of life is a few ravens hovering over us like some sort of omen. Six hours, 
cars. We've been walking. We've only gone up 3,000 feet. I've had it. Let's go in and get a bunch. Yeah. The plan is to spend one day here acclimatizing and leave at midnight the next night to climb the 3,000 feet to the summit. The track leads directly up the face of the mountain. We have to traverse it to climb the slope. See the southeast valley? If you come down that valley there, on either side of it, wherever you feel there's any lift. The flight will begin from the summit at 19,000 feet and end 15,000 feet below in the town of Moshi. We'll turn southwest. It's important for Bill and Steve to get as much height as possible at the start to clear the wide belt of rainforest. A film and rescue helicopter will wait at its ceiling altitude one mile below the summit. This mountain generates its own weather. Air flows up different directions and creates sometimes large rotors. It can flip a kite upside down fairly easily. A kite is uh, not much more than a leaf in the wind. Cloud is looming as a threat, much more than usual for this time of year. Danger is always present. Many lives have been lost on Kilimanjaro. It's not unusual for climbers to be brought down on stretches. Looking death in the face is not a new experience for Bill. He has cheated it many times before. The fairground flying that I did for five years puts you under a tremendous strain. It takes a lot of the joy out of living. In North Dakota, I had a bad flight. I climbed so rapidly that the rope snapped and the glider tumbled, and I fell from 300 feet. And on the way down, I expected to be killed, and I felt relieved that uh, the tension was over. I was quite happy to die at that point. But then I woke up three days later in hospital, and uh, the struggle was still on. That same day, the four strongest men, Peter and Thomas, Tobias and Balthazar, carry their burden to the top of the mountain. We are not enjoying life at this altitude. It is cold, and our appetites are gone, and we are plagued by headaches that get worse when we lie down. Sleep is impossible. Yeah. At one o'clock, the weather is looking good, and we begin our final assault, 3,000 feet to the summit. We must be on top by dawn to beat the clouds. Just as well we haven't eaten. Nothing would stay down. Our hands, our feet are freezing. We can't go fast enough to warm them. Now I know what they said. Two paces forward and one pace back. You keep sliding us. Just yeah. can't go any faster. Six days climbing for one hour's climb. <laughs> you better get a good flight out of it. The climb is like a nightmare. The only way is to put your legs into first gear and tell yourself you only have to do it once in a lifetime. Our reward at last is the sunrise over Mowenzi. Beautiful, but bleak. How steep is this? I'm exhausted. I've never breathed so hard for so long, ever, before in my life. This mountain saps our power. 
We're reeling from the climb. Lack of oxygen starves the mind and robs the body of strength. The takeoff is dangerously steep, and the wind is from the wrong direction. But we go ahead and assemble the gliders in the hope of a change. As the mountain heats up, the wind does change. Suddenly, it all becomes possible. Listen. If we're going to go, we've got to go. Can they help us to set up? OK. Can you do it? Can you go? We can go, man. If we can get off in the next 10 minutes, we can go. Let's get into it, you guys. Good, then we'll prepare, go we'll keep going, it. and everyone wants to go. But the same warmth that brings us the thermals is also producing the cloud. As quickly as it was on, it's all over. We're too slow. The clouds have closed in. We should have realized it was going to come around enough to get off. Well, we were doing our best anyhow. Did we waste a minute? We never wasted a minute. We should have gone for it this morning. Yep, we should have done. But we didn't know about all these problems, did we? Yes, we did. No, we didn't. Of course we did. Anyway. Let's go on now. The thought of climbing the mountain again plunges us all into despair. The only thing left is to wait on top and hope that it might clear in the afternoon. The high altitude made me feel uh, exhausted with every movement. It was uncomfortable to uh, even be there. You had to breathe deeply just to stay alive. The mountain will not be conquered. To succeed, we must harmonize with its moods. For a moment, the cloud rolls back like the Red Sea and reveals Moenzi, the promised land in the distance. But nobody wants to go. The cloud below is too thick. By four, we are on the way down, dismal and frustrated. What do you feel about when the conditions are no good? What can you feel except disappointment? And all the work that we put into it for nothing. I've never walked down a hill before. Wish I flew down and just landed in the saddle. Yes, yeah, Steve was desperate to fly, uh, even though the conditions were bad. But I held him back. I didn't think it was worth the risk. Nothing's worth the risk when the chances are 50-50. It's not a good enough chance. So I've got a lot of respect for that mountain. It's a tough one to climb and a tough one to fly from. We spend the next four days at Horombo Hut recovering. We've each lost eight pounds in weight. Everyone is dreading going up the mountain again. We go over the flight a hundred times, look at the mountain from every angle, and plan three different flight paths, including a flight towards Kenya. The possibility of failure is a recurring nightmare. The second climb is another punishing grind. But there's a different feeling this time, as if we've paid sufficient respect to the mountain. We've watched her moods and picked our day, and we are better acclimatized. On top, Remy has discovered a new takeoff site. More problems. Steve is suffering headache and double vision. But this time, we can't give up. I feel really bad. I can't focus on anything. I just want to get ready. The first clouds are forming in the valley. The race is on again. Did you have all your battens, Steve? Yes, sir, me. Right, Bill? Were you one batten short? Yes. Throw it over here. Just a minute, Randy. Where's what? That batten. Peter is now finding it for you. OK. The short one, the very shortest. Gliders are ready and checked. The tension shows through. Even small jobs are difficult. Temper's afraid. 
to do anything you like, but just do something, mate. We'll be right in half an hour. Just a matter of Steve feeling right now. Over. Watch the clouds, Bill. When you see them forming off those slopes where Harumbo is, give us a yell. We've got to go. Cameras rigged and tested. Switches operating. Oxygen running low. Got to get going. Bill is feeling the effects. We've got to get back around here. Too much longer. Radio's tuned and on. Helicopter ready. In position. It has a dual role, film and rescue. First clouds are up. Now is our last chance to break the grip the mountain has held over us for ten days. Good luck. Now, Ruby. Okay. Come around the front here. Pull one over down, Dick. Over to our house, Jack. How's it going, Dick? Stand by. Steve is feeling a little better, but still suffers headache. Dick will stay behind your neck. The wind is gusting to 25 knots. Bill will have to run hard to gain flying speed. Hey, Max. I'm here. There's a delay. Bill seems confused. At this altitude, it's hard to feel confident that everything will work. Okay, you're right now. There's the radio cord. Whether he planned it this way or not, Bill is on his own now. He has to launch himself. This is the final test. Out. No, he's not. He's okay. Get him to his feet. Chicken didn't attempt to do anything. He just fell in a heap. Haven't you done a harness check? Yes. Straighten out the glider. Can he make it? He has to. there. Then he drops into the prone. Steve's turn. He must draw on every ounce of energy for the run. Camera on. Good luck. Run, Steve, run. They're both away. Thank God. And Steve's going up like a rocket.
Steve's a lot easier to get on with. He's got a few years older in the last month. I realised that he did know what he was talking about when he said the launch was going to be difficult. I said, whatever's necessary, I'll do it. And uh, when I got there, I found that it was a bit beyond me and that Steve was more capable than I'd given him credit for. Walking up the mountain, there was no dignity in... Uh the relationship between Bill and I. But when it comes to the crunch, we both pull together in harmony with each other and everything comes out all right. To be born on the wind from a mountaintop, to soar like an eagle three miles up in the African skies, to rewrite the legend of Icarus, to make the vision of Leonardo come true, and just to know that we did it, these are the things that make it all worthwhile. Hey. 